muscle. And I think it's your script that you need to develop to build your resilience muscle because nobody can tell you exactly how to do it. Lots of ways you can do it, but it's your script. A few housekeeping details um, before we get started. I'm gonna be asking some questions and I'm gonna ask you to respond in the uh, chat box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and um, we'll also, nope, go back one. I will also um, be asking for questions and answers when Maria's done to either of us and please enter your questions in the chat box. Krista, who you just saw, is driving. She's in charge of the deck and she's in charge of the chat box and the Q&A. Um, and thanks to uh, Sunday Brunch Agency that she's here. Um, they're my partner in all of this. Uh, also, please mute yourself so we don't get any background noises. I know that people are in different places, some kids, some animals, some whatevers. So let's mute so we don't have any background noise. And to warm up our chat box ability, um, let us know where you are right now. I'm in Sarasota, Florida. Where are you? Anchorage, Alaska. Wow, Sarasota, lots of Sarasotas. We got West Coast, anywhere in between. All right, well, that's a good spread across the country. And again, thanks for choosing to, to join us. So this session is in two parts. One is to answer some very basic questions about resilience. Um, we can flip to our, our next screen. Um, we'll be talking about what is resilience. That word's been thrown around a lot, especially lately. So what is it? Why do we need it, especially now? Um, what are the ways to measure resilience? And we're not talking about if you used to smart measures, the um, specific, you know, measurable, achievable, realistic, time-bound kind of measures. They're much more qualitative measures, but you can measure your resilience. Um, and then how do you develop resilience? How do you build that muscle? And we're gonna be talking about both things to do right now and things to develop. And then we're gonna turn it over to a very resilient woman, uh, Major General retired Maria Britt. And I will introduce more about her later as we've known each other for over 20 years. And it was a very interesting meeting. And um, I was really proud to see her developed from a major to a uh, major general, which for those of you who count stars, those are two stars. So let me ask you in your chat box, when you hear the word resilience, what word do you associate with it? What one word do you associate with the word resilience? And for those of you that like time, 10 seconds. Flexible, strength, stamina, inner strength, determination, adaptable, strength, tenacious, strength, ability to persevere. Yeah, um, flip to our next, all very close to what psychologists say resilience is. It's the ability to recover quickly from difficulties. And I wanna spend just a minute talking about what quickly means. Um, there is no universal quickly for everybody. If you were in one of the last Zoom sessions, I talked about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's grieving, stages of grieving. And we all move through those very differently. And I talked about it specific to the pandemic that the first stage, you know, we were all kind of confused about what this virus was, but it was, it was over there. So we weren't really concerned about it. We were just confused. And then the next stage is a lot of us got angry because, wait a minute, it was over there. How did, it, how did it come here? How did we let it come here and spread the way it did? So we had a lot of anger pent up. And then we moved into somewhere on the continuum from sad to depressed. And it was, why is my life 
changing so much? Why did we have to let this happen? This is really sad. I can't be in person with my friends or family. I'm in my home. Um, I'm locked down or whatever you call that, that stage. Quarantine, lockdown, duck and cover, I, I, you know, whatever it was. Um, we were really sad and depressed about it. And then we moved on to uh, bargaining. Okay, this is real. So what do I have to do to move on? If I have to wear a mask and physically distance and wash my hands a lot to move on, I'll do that. Um, and then finally moving on to acceptance that this is a time of uncertainty. We don't know where we are. Um, and it just is what it is. This is reality. And so I just need to figure out how to live my life until things get a little more stable. So those are the, the stages that Kubler-Ross described that's very appropriate. But how you move through those, how quickly you move through those stages is totally up to you. And somebody very wisely asked in the last session, can you slide back and forth? Absolutely, you can. So just the way recovering quickly from difficulties um, is, is a part of resilience, your resilience and your quickly is totally universally up to you. But it's the ability to cope mentally and emotionally with crisis. So you're protecting yourself from unhealthy stressors. We all know there's three kinds of stress. There is eustress, which is a good kind of stress that happens with a good event, um, getting a promotion, moving into a new house, getting married, having a baby. All those things are stressful, good stress, but they're also time limited. So when that event is over, usually the stress goes away. And then there's the everyday stress. We, we can't help it. It just exists, whether it's driving in traffic when we're late and we're white knuckled on the steering wheel, whether it's standing six feet away from the person in front of us when there's a long line and we, we just really want to get out of there. Those are everyday stressors. And it's not so much the stressor because we can't get away from it. It's how we cope with it. And the last stress is distress. And that's the stress that causes ill health. And that's what we protect ourselves against if we have built a resilience muscle. The good news is, is we're not born with a certain amount of resilience. Um, it is something that can be learned. It's characteristics, it's qualities, it's skills. It's a muscle that can be built just like any other muscle. And keep in mind that one of the ways that kids learn is by watching their parents, their grandparents, um, their teachers, their role models, how we react to what's going on helps them build or not build their resilience muscle. And maybe it's the same way in our growing up, what we saw is whether we early on built a resilience muscle or not. Um, I'm going to be talking about research all throughout um, my presentation to you, and I'm not going to geek out and tell you the name of the research and who did it and all that stuff. I'll just say research has said, and you can obviously find the research um, clearly on the internet. There's so much being written about resilience, both books and papers and um, webinars. But a couple of the um, clear patterns of resilient people Number one, they ask for help. That kind of seems counterintuitive when you talk about resilience is strength and perseverance, and it makes you think of, you know, all capable. But, you know, let me tell you, if you haven't heard my story, I'm just gonna give you the top line. Um, I was one of these high capacity, red cape wearing super women who thought I can juggle any ball that was thrown at me. And when I was in my late thirties, I was working full time, I was in my doctoral program. I was married. I was uh, raising two young sons. And one week, my housekeeper quit. And I thought, well, I'll just throw that ball in with the rest of them and keep them up in the air. And it worked well for a while. So one Monday, I woke up with chest pains. And um, I thought, of course, I have chest pains. It's stress. Well, they didn't go away by Friday. And I went to the doctor. And he called me in his office after doing an EKG. And he said, I'm so sorry to tell you this, Jane, but you've had a heart attack. Well, that turned my world upside down. And I realized I needed to ask for help because my first thought was, why didn't my husband help me? Well, I found out he's not a mind reader. He didn't know that I needed help. I needed to ask for it. And that was a real awakening for someone who considered herself to be a high capacity woman. 
So resilient people ask for help. Resilient people can articulate their emotions, their worries, their fears, their sadness. It's a way of venting to be able to move on. Again, might seem counterintuitive to what we call resilience, but it's true. And they actually cope with stress because they ask for help, because they can vent, communicate, and articulate. Okay, so I think your responses were pretty in line with, um, with what psychologists talk about resilience. So let's talk about why we need resilience. Particularly, we need resilience in times of uncertainty. Um, and certainly now is a time of uncertainty. People like to know what they know. They like to do what they know. And when they're in situations where there's a lot of uncertainty, they feel very, very uncomfortable. Um, and, and so we need that resilience to say, we might not be doing things the way we always have been doing it. And we might not have all the information, but we'll get through this. I'll get through this. And right now we need resilience. Some of us are lost. We're lost for different reasons. Some of us have lost jobs. Some of us have um, been furloughed. Some of us have lost people we love. Um, and we feel overwhelmed because it's a whole different world right now. And some of us simply need a recharge. We're pretty resilient, but we need a recharge because everybody needs emotional support. And that's what comes from being resilient. Okay, so now we're talking about um, how do you measure resilience? Remember, they're not smart objectives the way we're used to. Um, but number one, it's the amount of support systems we have. And those support systems come from family, they come from friends, they come from colleagues, particularly with family and friends. Um, they're the people that we can call at two in the morning with a problem and they won't hang up on us. They're, they're there for us to help us work through whatever the issue is. Um, and with colleagues, you know, if we're working from home and we're on a team and we feel overwhelmed, they're the people we can count on to help pick up some of the slack while we recharge or get it back together. So we measure resilience by the amount of support systems we have and can call upon when we need them. Secondly, it's how we think about situations in terms of optimism. And let me relate a story to you. There were two very young, identical twin girls. One was so pessimistic, the sky was falling, the glass wasn't even half full, something bad was always gonna happen. And yet her identical twin sister was like Pollyanna. The sky was blue, the glass was overflowing, something good was always gonna happen. And her parents were real concerned. Why, why were they so different? So they took a, both the girls to a psychologist. And the psychologist sat them in a room and uh, the psychologist said, I'm gonna take you, the pessimistic sister, first down the hall, and I'm gonna stand you in front of a door, and when I open the door, please tell me what you see. And so uh, he takes her down the hall. I mean, she just drags down the hall because she knows it's gonna be something bad. Stands her in front of the door, he says, you ready? She goes, well, if I have to be. And he opens the door and she goes, oh my God, that's just a pile of manure. He goes, okay. So they go back down the hall. He puts her in the room, takes the optimistic sister. She goes skipping down the hall. She just knows it's gonna be something great. He stands her in front of the door and he says, you ready? She goes, yeah. Opens the door and she goes, look at all that manure. There must be a pony somewhere. So the point is, is how do you look at the situation? Are you looking at this pandemic and say, saying, I see a pile of manure? Or are you seeing some potential for ponies? I wanna take it to a more serious level. One of my favorite authors is Viktor Frankl. And Viktor Frankl was uh, a doctor who was um, a prisoner in a concentration camp in World War II. And he decided that he was going to study the prison population and kind of get a feel for what people are thinking. And what he realized was that 
the prisoners who had something yet to do, who found meaning in life, survived at a greater rate than those who thought it was hopeless and had nothing to live for. For himself, it was he had a paper he wanted to finish writing. For others, they wanted to be reunited with their family. But all of them had some sort of meaning in their life, and he founded the school of psychiatry called Will to Meaning. His books are fabulous if you don't know them or haven't read them. So um, his whole premise is based on finding meaning in your life, having hope. So my question to you right now is, in your chat box, what's one thing you hope for when this pandemic is over? Do we have an optimistic crew out there? Self-discovery. Sharing time with family and friends. I missed a couple. Smoother work processes, stability. Travel and time with family, amen. <laughs> Travel, but also prolonged. I can't see the rest of it. Travel, a lot of travelers, hug people, yeah. So um, sounds like a hopeful group and that's part of being resilient is having something to hope for, to look forward to, to find meaning to get beyond where we are right now. And the last part of how to measure your, resist, your, your resilience um, is a biological one. It's how well do you calm and soothe yourself? So instead of going from zero to 60, being able to go from 60 to zero, can you do that quickly? And one of the things that I've taught my coaching clients to do before they go into a performance appraisal is to do deep breathing. Because when you do those eight breaths in, hold for four, eight breaths out, you physically cannot be stressed. You are calming your nervous system down. So it's finding ways to actually biologically calm and soothe ourselves makes us much more resilient. So how do we develop this thing called resilience? And we're gonna talk about some strategies for right now and some strategies to develop if you haven't already. Those of you um, who know my core, my mission, vision, and values know that health is one of my core values. I think that you have to take, you have to choose to take time to be healthy or you're going to have to take time to be sick. And I would rather choose to take time to be healthy. And so it's really important that we, and I don't, I don't really like the word diet, but be more mindful of how we eat. I know when I get stressed, I reach those unhealthy carbs like potato chips. And that's really a no-no, that really drags you down. Um, so it's being mindful of what you're eating so that you don't get into that carb slump. Um, I'm going to couple sleep with something else. And I learned this when I was interviewing the 14 plus women for the first two editions of my book, You Can Have Your All. And these were high performing, high capacity women. And two things happened to them when they got overwhelmed. One was they sacrificed me time. It was my time to shut down and regenerate my systems. It could be a bubble bath. It could be reading you know, an escape book. It could be having a glass of wine. When they just got overwhelmed with everything, the first thing that went was me time. When that didn't work enough, the next thing that went is sleep. And they cut back on their sleep. And that's extremely unhealthy way to cope with being overwhelmed because you wake up the next day and you're not at full capacity you're tired and you know when you, you know when you haven't had enough sleep and you know experts say seven to eight hours well that's not everybody and that's not always possible but if you wake up in the morning after a few hours and you're dragging you haven't had enough sleep so those three things are about prioritizing your health that you can do right now Getting support is really critical. It's about communicating with family and friends and colleagues. You can't 
hug them right now, but you can communicate. I venture to say that a lot more is happening with family and friends and, and of course colleagues on Zoom, on FaceTime, uh, probably for me more than ever, um, than, because I can't be there in person. And in fact, this was really an upside of, of the pandemic. Uh, when it, Back in March, when I wasn't going anywhere uh, and I needed to color my hair, um, I'm not naturally just blonde, uh, I uh, went online to look for a color company that I could buy from. And when I went to put my name in, one of my college roommates names popped up and I hadn't talked to her in 20 years. I called her and we were just so excited to catch up, to exchange photos of families and to say, what happened? What, what happened 20 years ago that we stopped talking? So now we're reconnected. And it's always wonderful to talk to people from your past because you can almost talk shorthand. They were there at that point in your life and you don't need to explain a lot of things. Um, the other we talked about before, ask for help. The next one is support yourself. And this again came from another interview from the book. It was a woman who was a vice president um, of a large company and um, she always beat herself up over every mistake she made. And finally, her boss said to her, would you please take a powder and just relax and not be so hard on yourself, acknowledge that you made the mistake, learn from it and move on. He said, there is no reason to be so hard on yourself. And I think so, some of us are, are so hard on yourself and I'll raise my hand, I'm there. Um, we're very hard on ourselves when we make mistakes or we can't get everything done in a day that we plan to get done. Um, so sometimes good is good enough. It doesn't have to be perfect. And, and I learned that from another interview and this woman is um, general counsel for a very large company. And she said, and this is a lawyer, she said, well, I know something is right and it's 80% good, I go with it. The next 20%, I try and make it more and more perfect is a waste of my time. And we need to be thinking about that in all parts of our life, that sometimes good is just good enough. Um, the other thing is we have a lot of tapes in our head from growing up. Um, I know I have a lot of shoulds. I've tried to get better at controlling my shoulds. And I know my husband would be laughing if he heard this because if he thinks this is better, he can't imagine me before I was better. <laughs> um, and and it's, it's really thinking about the tapes in your head and what's rolling there, that it's a should that you don't need to pay attention to anymore. It's about what do you want? What do you need? What do you wish for? Those are the things that really nourish and, and support you. So, and if nothing else works, my father-in-law used to say, and this too shall pass. So that's a kind of a quick way to get over it and move on because it will pass. Even where we are now, it will pass. And the last thing has to do with positive affirmations. And I know you can find a lot of those online. On Mondays, I do quotes for Monday motivation to get everybody's week started. But there are also other things. Um, and one of the things that I do is I read books about resilient women. And on my blog, on my website, I have a post called Resilience and it lists the books that I've read about resilient women. It just so feeds me that there are women out there that I can admire that have been through way worse than I have and, and are so resilient. And it gives me that positive affirmation that I can get through this. I can do this. Um, another strategy, group of strategies is learning to cope. And again, if you've been on any of my sessions or read my book, you'll know that I'm really big on focusing on what you can control and influence and not what you can't control. There's an inner circle, small circle of things that we control totally. How we react to what's going on right now is one of those things. Then there's that circle of influence a little bit bigger. And those are things that if we work on a team, we have input, but we don't necessarily um, have the final say over everything, but we have enough input. And those two spaces, the control, 
much, much greater of your time, influence some, some of your time, stay out of the circle, the huge one of no control, where you're saying, I wish this pandemic didn't happen. I wish I didn't get laid off. Those are things that are so out of your control. It's like banging your head against the wall. When you stop, you'll know how good it feels. So spend your time in areas of control and areas of influence. Deep breathing, I mentioned. Meditation is fabulous. There is so much research on how it actually positively affects your brain and slows down your nervous system, your blood pressure. It's so good for you. And you know what? You can start with one minute of meditation and that's fine and keep building up. You don't have to be, you know, the Buddha on the mountain for an hour. Just start slowly. Even that one minute, even that five minutes will help. Pay more attention to positive things as opposed to the negative things which we tend to escalate and catastrophize. We need to focus on the positive side, believe it or not, of this pandemic. So I'll start. One of the positive things of this pandemic was I got to clean out my closets. And I could take the clothes that I'm not wearing anymore that are in good shape and take them to the Women's Resource Center, whose board I sit on, that has a career closet that other women who can't afford clothes can go and get clothes. So in your chat box, what's one positive of this pandemic for you? Quality time with family. Mm -hmm. Reading so many books. Yeah, I love it. Now you can think of positive things. A little shower? Is that what somebody said? Time to focus on personal reading, better workflows. Mm -hmm. No commute. Amen. How much of our life do we spend commuting? Scrapbooking, great memories. I want to get through all my photos. I haven't done that yet. Improved cooking skills. Cool. So you see, we can look, really look at a positive side of the pandemic, great time to review personal goals. And you know, for some of us, our personal goals have changed. This pandemic has helped us really focus on things that are important. You know, for a lot of people, it's basic survival and safety skills that are what's really important right now and everything else is icing on the cake. And it causes us to, um, to really better focus our, our needs, wants and wishes so um, yes, thank you for all those responses. I want us to feel good that there is a, a positive side to this pandemic. Um, and focus on what you can do. That is another mantra that I say every day. I'm gonna focus on what I can do rather than what I can't do. Because if I focus on what I can't do, I'm gonna get very sad and depressed again. So focus on the things that I can do. And everybody, I don't care what side of the aisle you're on, take a day off from the news. It, it just gets so overwhelming. And I've just chosen Saturdays. I do not read my feed. I do not turn on the television. I do not listen to any news. All right, let's move on then. So here are some things to develop if you haven't done that already that might not come quite as easily. One thing is to give support. And this is a really interesting one. Uh, if you're familiar with Martin Seligman, who's the father of positive psychology, he moved from simple happiness to well being. And one of his elements of well being is finding meaning. And finding meaning in his world is getting outside yourself um, to help others. And sociologists say that that's the element of well being that provides the most well being. So it's finding some charity um, if you can donate to donate to. I have friends who uh, deliver meals on wheels, and it's simply delivering the bags, knocking on the door, saying meals on wheels, and leaving. They're not interacting with the folks. 
but it's finding something that you get outside yourself to do good for somebody else or some group in the community. Work mindfully, and this took me a while to do because I'm a very structured, scheduled person, and I was used to um, going out there to coach clients, to do presentations, to do book signings, and all of a sudden I was home and I couldn't do all those things. And so I had to learn to structure and schedule my day at home for the most part for, for a while. And that was hard for me to do, but it really helped me feel productive, um, feel resilient. Um, setting boundaries, and this is a big one, especially for women. It's learning to say no, because no is a complete sentence. And we so badly don't wanna say no because we think people won't think we're a team player, they won't like us. In fact, I was just reading an article this morning, and I love this, um, learning to say no actually helps you with your time affluence. And it's a key to happiness that may actually be help you know when to say no. So I love that. We only have a certain amount of time, no matter what kind of superwoman we think we are, we only have 24 hours in a day. And we have to really think about our time affluence. How do we want to use our time? And no is perfectly fine to say. And I love the questions that are attributed to Ben Franklin. And I do that. In the morning, what good will I do today? How am I going to structure my time? How am I going to use my time affluence? And by the way, many of us need to break up with our morning dates with our phones. Because so many of us, the first thing we do when we get up in the morning is turn on our phone. And what happens when we do that is we now are paying attention to other people's priorities, other people's needs. And then somewhere along the line, we lose the time for our own needs. So it's making sure you know your priorities for the day before you turn on your phone and start responding to other people. And then Franklin would say at the end of the, every day, he'd say, what good have I done today? So did I do what I say I was gonna do? Um, if not, was it important? If so, can I schedule tomorrow? If I didn't do it, maybe it wasn't all that important because everything is not an A priority. So two questions to ask yourself each day. Develop a problem solving mindset. I love this. Um, I'm a fan of Madam Secretary, that, the show, if, if you've seen it. Um, uh, she is a secretary of state and uh, spoiler alert, she does become president. Um, and what I love about her role is it was always a problem solving mindset. When there was an issue with some country, she would make sure the issue was well-defined and then she'd immediately move into problem solving. And she'd go from the least invasive and yes, she could ratchet it up, but she moved from, we understand the problem, now what are we gonna do about it? And that's the kind of mindset we need to build resilience rather than obsess on the issue. It's know the issue, move on to solving it. And Marie will talk more about this um, about knowing who you are by focusing on your personal core. That's my term. Personal core is your, your personal mission, vision, and values. Um, Maria calls it her true north. Some people call it a north star, but it's essentially your guiding force that helps you decide every day between yes and no, so that you stay true to your values. And the last thing is to accept reality. And sometimes that's really hard. So I want to acquaint you with, if we can flip to the next slide, um, a study of 100 year old plus people. It was done by an academic and a psychologist named Nimi Hutnick. Um, and she's been in this field, for, resilience field for 30 years. And from this study, here's what she found. She found that these people accepted what they could not change. These people lived through World War I, World War II, the depression, and yet they just said, that's reality. And they were like the bamboo tree. They would just had the flexibility to, to change with the winds, to change with the time, to accept the reality. And the way they did this was they found meaning in their lives and they stayed engaged. 
So even though they're 100 and plus years old, one man is the president of his bowling club. Another woman still swims her laps. And yet a third clean homes for a living and at a hundred, she still does it because that's what kept these people engaged and provided meaning. So I wanna take you to a much younger Brazilian person um, that is uh, general retired Maria Britt. And I have to give her an intro because I am so proud to have been her friend and colleague for over 20 years. Marie and I met when um, I was the consultant doing a several year project with the Georgia Department of Defense, uh, probably more popularly known as the Georgia National Guard or the Georgia Guard. And part of what I did in that multi-year project was to facilitate the leadership team. And Maria at that time was a major, not on the team, because most of these uh, folks on the team were colonels. And um, the leader of the team knew that Maria had tremendous potential. So he invited her to sit in on the leadership team, which was a great way to develop people. And that started Maria in my friendship and uh, collegial relationship. And I watched her grow from that major to a major general, a two-star, and deserving every step of the way, facing many professional obstacles, but also personal obstacles. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I, I helped that organization develop a performance appraisal system. And the bottom line for people in the military is, would I follow that leader into battle? And I would say that the people um, under Maria's command would resoundingly say yes. So I'm gonna turn this over to Maria and I've got a couple of questions for her and I'm gonna let her fly because she's got some great stories of resilience and she is one of my most resilient people that I know. So Maria, are you there? I'm here. Okay, hi. Hi. Um, in your book, you explain the importance of having guiding principles for everyday life. Mm -hmm. It's really your personal leadership philosophy that you use in all parts of your life. And you have five principles, but there are a couple that are especially really important to build your resilience muscle and that helped you build your resilience muscle. Um, can you talk about that, please? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, let me just go through the five principles so everybody knows what they are, but this is my personal leadership philosophy that I've created over the last 35 years. So the first one is the warrior ethos. I will always place the mission first. I will never quit. I will never accept defeat, and I will never leave behind a fallen comrade. So that, that's the first principle. The second one is the golden rule. I will treat others the way I expect to be treated, and that includes leading. And then the third one is to give back. To me, it's always greater to give than to receive. And, and Jane touched on that some in, in the lecture. And I'll come back to that. The fourth one is to find peace through an integration of mind, body, and soul. Again, something that Jane has touched on. And then finally, laugh often. You know, we have to have a sense of humor, especially when it comes to ourselves, because otherwise we take ourselves too seriously. And we have that nervous breakdown that Jane was talking about. So uh, what I wanted to do was I, I looked at those five and I said, you know, which two would I pick? And after listening to Jane just now, I, I think what I'm going to do is go back to the give back, that it's greater to give than to receive. And part of that's because whenever I was feeling down, stressed, depressed, I would look outside of my circle to see what else was going on and where could I give back? Otherwise, you get yourself into a, a pity pool, you know, a pity party for one, and you just start fixating on your life and whatever your stressors are. And so I, I realized when I, I gave back that I actually felt satisfaction, I felt happiness, and then I also felt compassion and empathy for the people around me that were actually suffering more than whatever my situation was putting me through. So, and another phrase I like to use is paying it forward. I have had people that have helped me, and so I want to pay it forward. I want to help others. 
whether they be uh, veterans that I visit in nursing homes uh, or hospice care. I signed up for that shortly after I, I left uh, Kennesaw State University as a way to, uh, to uplift myself, to be with others, to give back. And I, I met an incredible World War II veteran. He served under General Patton. And I came in and he just, and I got down on a knee and I held his hand. He just couldn't wait to share with me his stories of General Patton. And his son was there with him and wrote me a beautiful thank you note afterwards that, you know, you brought my dad back just for a few minutes there to, to talk about his wartime experience. And, and I left there so uplifted, you know, I was able to give back, to share and just be present. Sometimes just being present is enough. And it, it makes me think of one of my favorite quotes from Winston Churchill that I, I've used oft, often. And that's that we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. So think about that. You know, are, are we making a life? Are we focusing on what we're giving versus just building wealth or prestige or you know, job progression? You want to give, you want to leave a legacy. And to me, whenever I gave back, it was greater than receiving and it uplifted me. So it became part of my resilience model to flex my muscle in that way. The second uh, principle that I, I think is important as well, and before I, I get to that, which is laugh often, I, I just wanted to reinforce what Jane said about health. I use the term, you know, to be healthy is the best return on investment that you're gonna have. So you, you can't afford to be sick. So put the time in to be healthy, and that's getting enough sleep, that's taking vitamins, that's exercising, that's eating nutritiously, and watching your weight. I always feel better when I'm on the lower side of my, my normal weight range uh, than when I'm on the, the upper end, because you've got to carry that extra five pounds of sugar around with you, and, and it's tiring, so let it go. So think about it in business terms. It's a return on investment to stay healthy. And then uh, another strategy I used for the, the finding peace, the integration of mind, body, and soul is to, to turn lemons into lemonade. I know it sounds trite, but while I was receiving counseling after one of those early life nervous breakdowns, my counselor told me, you know, take the lemons and make lemonade. Every time something makes you smile or something lifts your heart, write it down on a little slip of paper and put it in a basket somewhere or put it next to your desk. And then at the end of the week, gather up all those little slips of paper and go back and read what you wrote. And after the first week, I was just like, wow, this is amazing. It's little stuff. You know, it's the hummingbird that came to the feeder. It's the plant that grew through the crack in the sidewalk. It was my daughter smiling at me with no center teeth in her mouth. Um, it, it just, it was amazing the little things that I was missing, but by writing them down, I was able to use that to uplift myself once again. And then as far as the mindset, the positive mindset, what I work toward is having an attitude of gratitude, being thankful for what I do have, not wishing for other things that I can't have. So for example, just putting my feet on the floor every morning. Yes, I eventually reach for my phone, but I put my feet on the floor first and I say a little prayer to my God, thanking him for another day to make a difference. And I just say a little prayer. And, and part of that prayer, and, and again, Jane had touched on this, but it's called the serenity prayer. And that's the name for it if you want to Google it. But I ask God to give me the strength to accept things I cannot change. Give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. So serenity, courage, and wisdom. Quick prayer in the morning just to get you grounded. And it's not easy. I'll tell you, I'm one of those perfectionists that Jane talks about. And I'm a, a tough critic on myself. But you have to forgive yourself. And until you do, you will keep carrying that weight around with you. So learn from it, grow, but forgive yourself and move on. Can I ask you the second, can I ask you the second question? Because I think this is really okay. pretty good. Sure. Amazing stories. You know, we've been friends and colleagues, like I've told everyone, for over 20 years. It's hard to believe um, that I met you when you were pregnant with your third daughter. <laughs> and now she graduated college, which, <laughs> yikes. Um, 
So I'm familiar, I'm familiar with your struggles. I've, I've felt your pain. We've talked about it over time. Would you mind sharing a few of those struggles personally and professionally with everybody? And what are the strategies that you use to become resilient, to survive and thrive? Okay. Well, I, and I do have a lot of stories. That's why I had to write a book, but I, I think I'll give you a couple of my early on stories. And the, and the first one, I, I went to the United States Military Academy at West Point. I was in the fourth class of women to go to West Point back in uh, 1979. And it was tough. We were not accepted at the academy. They were just switching over the latrines, uh, male to female latrines. The cadre was... Uh, um, not totally cooperative, although we had a good superintendent. And along my, my path, I, I, my plea year was difficult, but my third year, we were selected to go to different schools, and I was picked to go to the Jungle Warfare School in Panama. Not Panama City Beach, but Panama. <laughs> I'm talking to my younger crowds, I have to distinguish that it was Panama. There is a country. And um, what I didn't know is that my roommate and I would be the first women to go through this course and it was run by Marines and as soon as we got there we knew right away it, it was a pretty hostile environment from the cadre. We got through the training pretty quickly. Yes, I had leeches on me from the rivers that we had to go through. I had uh, jungle rot on my foot and they wanted to, to boot me out for a blister and a, a fungus infection but others had that as well. I said no, I'm just going to gut it out. Well, we did so well, the last uh, couple of days were open, so the cadre came up with a, an operation called helicasting, where you jump out of a perfectly good Chinook helicopter, that's the helicopter that has the double blades, and then the back gate just opens up, and they drop out Jeeps and different cargo, except this time they were dropping us out. And when you land, you have to land with your, your M16 above your head uh, locked, and you're in full gear, you're jumping a couple hundred feet from the back of the Chinook into a, the Bay of Panama, and then you're swimming to an RB-15, a rubber boat for 15, and then assaulting the shore. So I figured no problem. Well, when I jumped out of the, the helicopter, my arms weren't exactly where they should have been locked, and my weapon came down on the bridge of my nose and ended up breaking my nose in two places. And uh, the motorboat was flagged down, the Marines dragged me into the boat. They didn't have any first aid equipment or rags, so they used the dirty rags they had in the boat to sop up the blood. Head wounds are very bloody. Uh, a couple minutes later, I heard more commotion. Someone else, one of my male classmates, had done the same thing, but his weapon came down on his upper lip, and he cut off his lip and knocked out his two front teeth with his weapon. So he's hauled into the boat. Well, long story short, we've got two days left, and I'm continuously avoiding the cadre taking pictures of me. I was covering my face, my classmates were trying to help me. But on the last day, the last meal, I was carrying a tray on the, to the conveyor belt. I couldn't cover my face and a, a photo got snapped. And you know, when you have a broken nose, your eyes swell up, you're all black. I call it my zombie look-alike. I, I really, my face was just a swollen pus pot. It was really grotesque. And here a picture was just taken of me well, we left. In fact, my, the guys that I were with said, hey, do you want us to go after him and grab the camera? And I said, no, no, no. You know, my mom always taught me when you wrestle with a pig, you're both going to get muddy. I said, so let it go. We're out of here in a few hours. Not worth it. Well, several months later, my roommate happened to be dating a cadet who graduated, went to ranger school, and was assigned to jungle warfare school. And he went into the cadre lounge, and in the, on the bulletin board, he saw my picture picture that had been taken of me. And under the picture, there was a caption that said, this is what happens when women come here. Well, when the word got back to me, I was, I was devastated. I was embarrassed. I was humiliated. I, I was angry. But, the, you know, again, there was not a whole lot I could do about it. Now, this officer had the picture taken down and explained he wasn't going to tolerate that. And you know, since then, other classes of women have gone through the, the jungle warfare, warfare school. But for me, I was 19 years old and having to deal with this, this setback. And it, it taught me some valuable lessons right up front. One, you don't want to get down and, and wrestle with the pigs. Stay on the high ground. Yes, get angry. 
but then I allowed that anger to fuel my resolve. Now, I earned this, I did this, I earned this jungle warfare expert patch and I'm gonna wear it proudly. I paved the way for other women to go to this school and, and dozens have graduated since 1981 when I attended. So, and then, you know, it's, it, it was just, for me, it was insightful because as Jane said, you have centers of influence and things that you can control. And I realized that, you know, if you want to influence the fight, if you want to make a difference in the organization, then you've got to stay in the fight, right? So it, it was debilitating for me. And then I had other things with the National Guard and with other places that I worked where I, I felt the resentment. And so do I stay and fight or do I fly? Do I leave? Do I quit? Do I accept defeat? No, this is going to make me stronger. It's going to make me better. And I'm standing my ground. So it was worth it. And, and that, that reminds me too of my first day in the National Guard. I, I was a, a young captain. I just had come off of eight years of active duty, Fort Hood, Texas, Fort McClellan, military police. I was sharp, I was on my game. And I, I get to the National Guard on a Saturday morning and I go to report in and on the way to, to reporting in, I pass this Colonel who's uh, standing outside. He's got a stogie in the side of his mouth that wasn't lit. He had a cup of coffee in the other hand and a foot up on a log. And he said, Captain Britt, come on over here. And so I went over, yes, sir, good morning, sir. Sharp salute. And he said, uh, I just want to welcome you to the Georgia National Guard. And I said, well, thank you, sir. It's, it's a proud honor for me to serve my state and my country. And he said, yeah, I'm glad you're here because we need more good looking women around here. Well, I mean, I, I was so deflated. I, I was in shock. I did not know how to respond. And I just stood there and I saluted back, morning, sir. And I walked off and I called my husband and I said, you know, I don't think this is going to work. I can't do this. I, I just came off of active duty professional organization. And now here I am in the, the Georgia National Guard. I was the senior ranking woman and I could understand why we had very few minorities, if any. And uh, that was 30 years ago. And my husband told me, you know, oh, who was it? Where was it? Oh, I know who that is. He's, you know, don't worry about him. He's on his fourth wife. He's on his way out. It's going to be okay. Not everybody's like him. And I, I realized that every organization is going to have its dinosaurs. And so what do you do? You know, you, you kind of, you can avoid them, but you can also wait for extinction. I was young at the time. So for me, extinction was an option. Sometimes it isn't and you have to fight. But in this case, he, he didn't mean it as an insult, but it, it hurt like an insult because I was a professional soldier and I didn't want to be viewed as a, a woman, a sex symbol in the organization. So, but I learned from that and I did stay and I worked to change the culture of the organization because you can't influence the fight unless you stay. It took me 20 years and then moving through the ranks, but I, I feel like I, I did much good to change the culture for other women and minorities in the Georgian, in the Georgia Guard. And I watched you in that fight and there were obstacles. It was tough. I had many complaints against me and, you know, I was maligned. I got nasty emails. I got death threats but I stayed the course and I fought the good fight. You exceeded every expectation and that's why you, you got to be a major general. Um, I wanna open it up for a couple of minutes of Q&A. Anybody wanna ask Maria or myself a question? <laughs> <laughs> I am a badass. <laughs> also a military person. <laughs> yes. Anybody? Questions? Floor is open. Give you about 10 seconds to think about it before we wrap up. I have one more point too, if you don't get any more questions. Okay, well, shoot, go ahead. All right. Well, and, and one more thing about being resilient, you need a plan B. And what I, I call it plan B, but more appropriately, it's an exit strategy. Right, you need to know when it's time to leave an organization. And this one really caught me off guard because I, I didn't realize that my 20 years with the Georgia Guard was coming to an end. And the higher you move in an organization, the more political it becomes. And um, I had not done a good job of networking. 
and letting people know who I was. And, and it's so important for people to know who you are. And I, I had some business cards, but I really didn't have a plan B. I didn't have an exit strategy and it, it hit me cold and it hit me hard. So think about that and, and build networks outside of your current job. And don't, and don't let your ego get attached to your job either, because then that'll bring you down faster than anything. And you know, that um, plan B and exit strategy also uh, relates to personal relationships, um, whether they be you know, significant others or, or friends. Sometimes plan B is, is the best plan, especially um, in terms of resilience. If you're around people who drag you down, they're going to undo what you've done to build your resilience muscle. And it's better to use plan B and start building it back up than to continue to be dragged down. Okay, so Maria, there's so many more stories you have and so many more lessons, which um, we're gonna send out a real brief survey to help us focus our December 9th Zoom session. And when you return the survey, I'll send you this deck and it'll have information about Maria, her book, my book, ways to continue to engage with me if you choose to, about the online course, about coaching, um, social media. So I'll, I'll be glad to send you the deck when you send the survey back. But as a way to wrap up, um, let's get to some final thoughts. Christian, if we can get there. So go back, yes. So one of the books that I've read, uh, it's by Atul Gwande, it's called Being Mortal. And while he's an MD who focuses on last chapter, end of life sort of things, his whole philosophy and the questions he asks are so relevant for us. But I love, particularly love this quote, you may not control life circumstances, but getting to be the author of your life means getting control of what you do with them. And I think that's so poignant for where we are right now. And I'm a big believer that you can listen to a session like this and that's really great. But where the rubber meets the road is, what are you gonna do about it? So in your chat box, what is one small step you'll take this week to become more resilient? What's one small step you'll take to become more resilient? Get in the habit of saying serenity. I will try to breathe, not to be hard on myself. Learn to say no. Yes, Get, well, not yes, but no. Take more time for myself, big one for women. We'll try to ask for help, another one for women. Real important. So it's about what you choose to do now that you've heard, um, let's see, work the to-do list, making sure you have a realistic to-do list and don't beat yourself up if you don't get to everything. Um, so, so review what you've heard, really commit to take one action because one small step will lead to another one that will lead to another one. And it's all about building your resilience muscle so you can be who you want to be, and it's about your script and your all. Thank you for participating and spending the last hour with us. We appreciate it. Thanks, Jen. You're welcome. Thank you for the comments, and you're welcome to everyone. Have a good rest of the day, whether you're on the East Coast or West Coast. <laughs> Stay strong.